So in this video, we're going to talk about pressure testing with pure nitrogen alone. And there's several scenarios to do this. The most used method of this is going to be before we pull a vacuum. Before we pull a vacuum, we want to make sure that there's no leaks in that system because we can burn a lot of time. We can waste a lot of time trying to pull a vacuum only to realize that there's a leak and we have to start over. So pressure testing is a very important step to do before we pull a vacuum. If you remember, when we're brazing that system, we definitely recommend flowing nitrogen through the system while we're brazing. That prevents oxidation buildup. So we already have our nitrogen tank and our regulator with us. The only difference is we'll need that flow regulator when we're flowing nitrogen through while we're brazing. In this case, we have everything set up. I removed the flow regulator because we don't need it. Now our nitrogen tank has several thousand PSI in here. So we have to reduce that pressure before we put it into the system. We don't want to blow out the system. So here I have my nitrogen regulator. On this side is giving me the pressure in the tank. And on this side is giving me the pressure in the hose. This side, the pressure in the hose, I can adjust with my regulator. I can back it out to decrease pressure and turn it into increased pressure. Now again, there's several thousand PSI in here, so we definitely recommend wearing safety glasses when you're working with this high pressure nitrogen. And just as important, we want to make sure this nitrogen tank is in a place where it won't fall over. If this tank was to fall over and hit, I could bust my regulator or worst case scenario, I could break the fitting off here and there'd be an uncontrolled flow of nitrogen coming out of this tank. So making sure the nitrogen's up against the unit, there's some tools around it, it's in some kind of a carrier where it won't fall over is a simple little thing to prevent any problems. A lot of technicians like to leave their regulator attached to the tank at all times. And if you do that, you want to make sure you're following your DOT rules, but also make sure that that tank is secure where it's not going to fall over. I've seen people before where they use a quick little bungee cord. The bungee cord breaks, this falls over, and they end up ruining their regulator. These regulators are expensive. We want to make sure we take care of them. So having it in a secure location. Other technicians like to take them off completely and put the regulator in their service van. If you do that, you want to make sure you put this in some kind of a foam box because as this regulator is bouncing around on any kind of a surface, it could also damage that regulator. Also, when we put the regulator on our nitrogen tank, we want to make sure we use an adjustable wrench or an open end wrench so that when we tighten this up, the full tightness, we're using the proper tool, it's getting a good connection. I see a lot of times an apprentice will go and grab a set of pliers and they try to put the pliers on this brass fitting. And brass is a soft metal, so when you put pliers on the brass, it mars the end. It really messes up the end. So I tell my students, if you use pliers on my brass, I'm going to kick your but don't use pliers on this. We'll make sure you use the proper adjustable wrench. So here we have our nitrogen tank set up. We have it hooked to our typical manifold gauge set. We're going to cover other scenarios in this video also. And then we have it hooked up to our system like we normally would. Now, if you're pressure testing these components individually, then you could individually go to any one of those components. If I could test the high side only, then I could test it up to 300. If I was testing the evaporator only, I could test it to 300. If I was testing my line set only, we could typically go much higher than that. In this case, its test pressure says 150 PSIG on the low side, so we're going to test it up to 150 PSIG. Now, it's not an exact number. We don't have to be right on that number, but that's just a safe guideline to make sure that you're doing things safe, easy as possible, without causing any damage. Because beyond thinking about the equipment itself, we also have to think about metering devices, expansion valves, other controls that are in there that could be damaged by having too much pressure. On new pieces of equipment, most of the time you have refrigerant stored in the condensing unit and then the line sets are open and then your evaporator coil comes pre-charged with nitrogen. So when you open that evaporator coil line set, you hear nitrogen coming out. If you don't hear nitrogen coming out, on a brand new system, that's always a sign for concern that there's a possible leak in that brand new evaporator coil. On a new system, we're typically only pressure testing our refrigerant lines and the brazes that we install. That's what we're looking at the most, even though we're also pressure testing the evaporator coil. And on that new system, the outdoor unit comes most of the time with refrigerant pre-charged inside the condensing unit. It is possible that during that scenario or a pump down where I'm storing refrigerant in the condensing coil and I put too much pressure in the line sets, it is possible for me able to push nitrogen through and past this valve and actually mix nitrogen with my refrigerant. There's an argument on how likely that is to happen. I haven't done any tests on that, but it is a possibility, especially if you have an older valve or somebody brazed the valve and they cause damage to it. So if you put too much pressure in the line set, you theoretically possibly could be pushing nitrogen past that valve into the system. Again, we can eliminate all those scenarios by following the lowest pressure test point to know that we're safe and in good condition.
All right, so let's get started with pressure testing the system. We're going to go through three examples. The first example is going to be the old school typical manifold gauge set. For this example, I have the valves closed to simulate a pump down situation or say a new system with all the refrigerant already stored in a condensing unit. So we're only going to be testing from the line set over to the evaporator coil. So we're going to start off with is make sure that our valves here are closed. We're also going to make sure our nitrogen regulator is backed out before we open the nitrogen tank. So now I open the nitrogen tank and we can see that we have less than a thousand PSI. We can also see that on our other side we have zero PSI. Here I just want to put pressure into the hose. Our valves are closed and I want to put more pressure on the hose side than what I want to be testing it. The reason is so it actually flows out faster. These hoses are rated for up to 800 PSI but I want to put say about 300 PSI in there. So now I have 300 PSI on the regulator and hose side so we're ready to start putting nitrogen into this unit. What we're going to do is open either the high side or the low side. I personally like to open the high side first because the high side gauge is rated for a whole lot higher pressure. So that nitrogen comes in and spikes across here it's less likely to do any damage. It's also the way the refrigerant flows so I can see what's happening on my suction side and see it rising up. This will also tell you if you have a situation where you have a solenoid valve closed off, electronic expansion valve closed off, or a TXV that's closing down. This will tell you on the other side it only goes up so much and it stops. So here we go, we're going to open the high side. I'm going to watch the low side to get to 150. We're at 150. But also I hear leaks right here. This is very, very common. Even on new systems, these are notorious for leaking, especially in old systems where they're overheated while they're brazing. So what I want to do is always put the caps on there. I want to put a little nylog on there to make sure the threads are sealed and we put the caps on. Now even with the caps on, I still hear it leaking. So it's important that we tighten it up with our adjustable wrench. And again, these are made of brass, so to make sure we use the proper tool for the proper job, no pliers on brass. So we can see that our pressure dropped. We want to go ahead and add that 150 back to get our starting point. So now we're at 150 and again I chose that number because that's the lowest test pressure on this piece of equipment. So now that we have it pressurized with nitrogen, we have the three options to look for a leak. One option is we can use a bubbles leak detector, something like True Blue. We can spray it on all of the connections, and that works really great, especially on a new piece of equipment where we know the evaporator coil is not leaking because it comes pre-charged with nitrogen, and we know that there's refrigerant in the condensing coil. So really, all we are doing is pressure testing our connections. We can put the leak detector on these fittings. We can be very patient and see if there's any bubbling of any kind. That is one option. It doesn't work great though if you're trying to test for a leak inside the evaporator coil because you have all of the fins and it's almost impossible to use enough of that material to soak the entire fins. So that type of product is good for localized leaks such as these braze connections. And the third option is an ultrasonic leak detector which listens for a frequency of the leak. leak. The ultrasonic leak detector is going to hear if there's any leaks. So we can listen around all these components, we can listen inside that evaporator coil, and that's typically more accurate for finding a leak. There are some things we want to keep in mind when you're doing an ultrasonic leak test. One of the things is to make sure that we have some oil inside the refrigerant lines. That oil and the sound of that nitrogen coming out with the oil will be much more likely to pick up with an ultrasonic system. The problem is if we have a brand new system with brand new line sets, brand new evaporator coil, there won't be any oil in there for it to hear. So the other option is having wet or moisture on the outside of the lines. Something as simple as a spray bottle, we can spray water on the connections, we can spray water on that evaporator coil, and that water will allow a frequency as the nitrogen is coming out, reacts with that water, the sound that it makes is much more likely to be picked up by an ultrasonic leak detector. That is one of the options for testing with just pure nitrogen alone. And the third option we have is simply pressure testing with time. I've pressurized it up to 150 PSIG and we can wait and see if that pressure moves. But there's two problems with this method. Problem number one is accuracy. Here I have these analog gauge sets. This one goes up to 800 PSI. Each one of these little white marks are 5 PSI each. So that needle, the width of the needle is about the same width as one of those marks. It's very difficult to see if that needle's moved. So over an hour's time, you've already lost 5 PSI. That's a significant leak that you need to look for, but it's almost impossible to see that, especially as you get older and your vision's not as good. But if we look at the compound gauge or the suction gauge, its numbers are farther apart. 
Here we only have 500, so there's less number in the same amount of space. So it's easier to see if there's a change, but still there's five PSI between each one of those marks. Even though those marks are farther apart, it's easier to see movement. It's still very difficult to see if there's a change. This is where the digital gauges are gonna come in handy. The second issue with that is gonna be temperature. Nitrogen changes its pressure with temperature. It follows the gas laws. So if I have a nitrogen test going on and the temperature increases, your pressure should be rising. The same scenario, if I have a nitrogen test set up and the temperature drops, my pressure is also going to drop. So we need to take that into account. Here's why that's important to know. I've seen people before, at the end of the day, they pressure test the system to say 150 PSI. They go home at night, they come back the next day, and they see that the pressure has significantly dropped. And they spend hours looking for a leak that's not there. As the temperature through the night dropped, the pressure of the nitrogen dropped, and they're looking for a leak that's not there. A similar scenario is a team goes out and they hook up and do a pressure test first thing that morning. They do a pressure test, now they're doing duct work, electrical. At the end of the day, they're testing to see if they're good. The problem is they're exactly where they left it, at 150 PSI. But there may be a 30 degree difference between the morning and the nighttime temperature. The pressure should have gone up. However, they're looking at that and they're seeing that the pressure is exactly the same. In that scenario, there was a leak and the nitrogen was leaking out. But as the temperature went up, the pressure went up and it kept it all the same. So there was a leak in that system that they never found. They ended up having to go back later and fix the leak. It's much easier to fix a leak before you ever pull a vacuum. Once you pull a vacuum and then you have your refrigerant flowing through there, it's much more work to go back and fix a leak. Then you have to pump all the refrigerant down, recover that last little bit. You have to get your torch out, your nitrogen tank out, flow nitrogen while you're brazing, replace the filter dryer, pressure test again, pull a vacuum again, and hope that you don't have any contaminations because the POE oil is hygroscopic absorbing moisture. So that's not to scare you, but it's also to motivate you to spend the time looking for a leak before you pull a vacuum and before you release the refrigerant into that system. There is a method though that we can count for that temperature change and we'll do that in another video. In this case, we're done with our pressure test, so we're gonna make sure that both of these valves are closed. We're also gonna close our tank off. Now what we can do is bleed the nitrogen back out. So I'm just gonna loosen this hose here and this hose and also this hose. If you notice when I loosened this hose, my regulator pressure dropped down to zero and also the pressure on my tank side dropped to zero. Because my tank's closed off, it's bleded off of both sides. It bled out here and we're still bleeding out the nitrogen on the low and high side. Because the air is 78% nitrogen, it is okay to release the nitrogen back into the air. So just because you hear hissing sounds doesn't mean that somebody's venting refrigerant. In this case, we're letting the nitrogen go back to its home, back to the air around it. So we're simply bleeding that nitrogen off. We want to make sure that we get most of that nitrogen bleed off. We want less than one or two PSI before we ever get our vacuum gauge hooked up. I have seen students make the mistake of having nitrogen pressure still in the system. They hook their vacuum pump up to it and that nitrogen pressure, bam, blows the ballast out of their vacuum pump. So by bleeding this down to less than one PSI, we know that we're not going to have any of those kind of issues. Now that this is done, we can take the tank, put it back in the truck, we can set up to get ready to pull our vacuum. That's just one example with our analog manifold gauge sets. Let's now do another example with digital sets.